Hello everyone, I am Nathan P. Butler, and this is my Star Wars vlog, the voice of reason or lack thereof. Thank you for stopping by. This is my channel, of course, where you can find things like from the Star Wars Home Video Library, Let's Plays of LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens, or the Disney Infinity 3.0 Star Wars play sets, uh, Fantasy Flight Games reviews, and so on and so on and so on. Lots of Star Wars content here. Over 600 videos at this point. I'm going to warn you up front, this is a long one, been away for a while. Now, it's going to feel like this episode is going to bounce around a little bit. It's been a while since I've done a vlog. I've just finished moving and finally got the Star Wars room ready to go here. You can see that on the channel with all the deco lights and everything on the walls. My library, so to speak, put back together behind me in chronological order, of course, because what other order would you put it in? Um, so it's taken a while for me to get back into a setup where I could do another of these vlogs. And in the intervening time, a few things have popped up. I want to address a few things, those few things, here together. And if there is one sort of overarching theme to it, or one through line that connects it all, it's a concept that I hold very near and dear, and that I have tried to espouse quite a bit in any of the videos that I've done over the years, or any of the podcasting that I've done since 2002 when I started Chrono Radio back in the day, whether it's the current podcast I'm involved with now, Cloud City Casino, or Star Wars Beyond the Films over at StarWarsReport.com, whether I'm working on my Star Wars Timeline Gold, StarWarsFanWars.com slash Timeline, might as well get those out of the way early, um, or anything in between. I'm tending to try to focus on this idea of intellectual honesty. Now, we're not talking about just general honesty. General honesty is, you know, being true, uh, talking about real facts rather than fiction, trying to make sure that what you say is valid, and so on. Uh, that's sort of the broader sense here. When we say intellectual honesty, we're trying to narrow it down to honesty within the context of debate, of discussion, of productive conversation. The idea that you want to make sure that when you are in debate, you are using fact. You are not throwing out incorrect information constantly. You're not trying to mislead people. You are not trying to essentially uh, make stuff up on the fly and pretend that it's true. Uh, if you're talking about reviews, intellectual honesty means looking at something, recognizing that very little in the world will ever be truly perfect. So you're trying to look at both the positive and negative aspects of things and look at them within a context and so on. Intellectual honesty as opposed to intellectual dishonesty. It's opposite, where you're trying to push false information. In a lot of ways, I think intellectual honesty, one, helps make sure that discussion is productive and that everybody's on the same playing field. If everybody's working on the same actual facts, everybody's living in the same reality, we can have some productive discussion on big issues, whether we're talking about really serious stuff, like what happened in Dallas the other day with the five officers killed, the seven others injured, how that connects to the broader theme of police violence and the Black Lives Matter movement and the validity thereof or not and so on, all that kind of stuff, that's deep, deep stuff. Or we could talk about something like Star Wars. But whatever we're discussing, we should have a thread of intellectual honesty that is guiding us so that we can have discussions based on the same playing field where we can actually come up with solutions, good ideas, or at least know that whatever we've discussed has been founded in actual reality as opposed to some fantasy world BS that someone is spouting. Now, to me, I do draw a line because there's a difference, I think, because we're all human, between being mistaken, being wrong, having the wrong information, and being intellectually dishonest. Someone who is wrong can be corrected. Someone who is mistaken can be corrected. If I walk into a debate and somebody is spouting off information that is incorrect, but they don't know any better because that's what they've always been taught or that's what they thought was true, we can correct them that, oh, my bad. Let's keep discussing. It's when you know something is false. You know it is objectively untrue. Not subjectively. Subjective is opinion. Okay? Uh, but something that is objectively untrue. And you keep spouting it even though you know that it's a lie. Even though you know that it is not even remotely fact. You are being intellectually dishonest. For instance, if I were someone who was a big fan of, let's say, the original trilogy, and I walk into a Star Wars discussion and I start proclaiming that there have only ever been three Star Wars films because I disavow the existence of the prequels or of The Force Awakens, I am being intellectually dishonest. Unless up front I tell people that is my personal perspective. But even then, it's still an intellectually dishonest foundation on which to build your debate if you are dismissing those films as non-existent because, of course, they exist. 
I'm not going to get too much in the idea of head cannon or personal cannon or whatever. Suffice to say that those types of things where you're sort of making up your own canon of what's real and what counts and what doesn't in your head, um, that is not a valid place for argumentation unless you are arguing specifically on the merits of headcanon or something like that, or you are prefacing your argument with that, and usually it's not really going to be something that works well within broader discussion. But at least if you're acknowledging it, it's not necessarily entirely intellectually dishonest. It's just not really a, a solid foundation to work from most of the time in debate. But the key here is intellectual dishonesty refers to that whole pushing of false information when you know that it is false. Being wrong is one thing. Being mistaken is one thing. That's all a part of being human. But when you've got the objective facts and you are simply making shit up that fits your argument, you are being intellectually dishonest. Uh, by the same token, opinions. You can make the argument that, well, everybody has an opinion. An opinion can't be wrong because an opinion is just an opinion. It is subjective. True, as far as it goes. But opinions need to be based on something. And if an opinion is based on false information, if an opinion is based on incorrect information or lies, that opinion loses much of its credibility or validity. For instance, if you say that it is your opinion that President Barack Obama has been a bad president, and your opinion would be based on something that you can pull out that is factual that you believe was negative, like Maybe it's the impact of the Affordable Care Act. Maybe it's something relating to uh, policies relating to the military or ISIS slash ISIL, whatever it is that you want to pull out that is actual factual information, then you can form that opinion. You have a solid basis for it. Others may believe that you are wrong, but at least your opinion has some factual basis, as opposed to saying you believe that President Obama has been a poor president because he was born in Kenya. No, he wasn't. Shut the fuck up. That is intellectually dishonest opinion, because you are basing your opinion on false information. Okay? So laying that foundation here, intellectual honesty is the through line. And this brings us to the first of the pieces in the puzzle here for this vlog, which is Mace Windu's alive! Or is he? Mace Windu was presumed dead after Revenge of the Sith. He gets his arm cut off by Anakin, gets blasted with Force Lightning by Darth Sidious, flies out the window, never to be seen again. But of course, because this is science fiction, and we've been primed by years and years of television, movies, comic books, novels, and so forth, uh, there was a belief that maybe he survived. Why? No body, no death, right? We haven't seen him dead, therefore he could still be alive. And, of course, there is now precedent of someone who was assumed to be dead in Star Wars in a movie and essentially left behind in storytelling coming back later at the behest of Lucas, in that case, uh, or whomever, Darth Maul. But this whole thing started to blow up at the end of June. On June 25th, and it's important to get the facts straight on this, right? On June 25th, Samuel L. Jackson held a live video Q&A on Twitter. People would tweet him questions, he would answer with quick little video answers. And Angelica Rabenstein, going under at Star Wars Girl 1, asked whose idea it was to kill Mace Windu. She did not ask, is he alive? She asked whose idea was it to kill Mace Windu. And in his reply, Jackson says that Lucas chose to kill him because he was the only character left in Revenge of the Sith whose death would mean anything. And he argued instead, that is, Samuel L. Jackson, argued instead for being injured or something, you know, couldn't you just injure me, etc., etc., he ends the comment with, but in my mind, I'm not dead. Jedi can fall incredibly high distances and not die. So all of a sudden, people are like, holy shit! Samuel L. Jackson says that, as far as he's concerned, Mace Windu's alive! Mace is alive! To compound this, we get to essentially phase two. June 29th, four days later, Jackson is briefly interviewed by Entertainment Weekly Radio on Sirius XM. At that point, he reasserts his belief, noting, of course he is, that is, of course Mace is alive. Jedi can fall from amazing distances, and there's a long history of one-handed Jedi, so why not? However, Entertainment Weekly Radio then asked him if he had shared that view with any of the creative forces behind the Star Wars franchise, and he says, at the time, that he shared that view only with one person. George Lucas. He notes that George's response was, 
Quote, George is like, I'm okay with that. You can be alive. What many are missing, though, is that in the same answer, Samuel L. Jackson even says, but George doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. This blew up on social media. We enter phase three. The story blows up, and finally on May 6th, Pablo Hidalgo is asked by at RaisingHope96 on Twitter, quote, is Mace Windu alive in Star Wars canon? This is for my friend who is having coping issues with his death. Thanks. Pablo Hidalgo replies, short and sweet, as tweets often are, Mace died in episode three. Condolences. Wait. Finally, on May 6th? Wasn't the original story at the end of June? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Pablo addressed the Mace Windu issue over a month before it became an internet sensation, thanks to the Twitter conversation with Samuel L. Jackson. He, after the fact, though, he then retweeted to sort of reiterate what was going on here, what the official stance was from the story group. He retweeted, Oh, Katrina, on June 29th, saying, For what it's worth, Dead Mace Windu probably thinks he's still alive, too. That was what Oh, Katrina said. He retweeted it as a joke. He also added, Sam can think anything he wants. Who am I to argue? Again, kind of going to the head canon, personal canon thing. When asked the next day on June 30th whether the headline, quote, Samuel L. Jackson, actor says his Star Wars character Mace Windu is still alive, his answer was typically tongue-in-cheek. It is true he said that, yes. When asked as a follow-up, so he may be in Rebels then? He replied to clarify his sarcasm, read my response again. So, the official word here, both before and with the sarcastic, amusing answers after the fact, uh, with Jackson's Twitter chat, is that Mace Windu is, in fact, dead. And yet, you still see the stories and debates circulating and people going ape shit over this idea that Samuel Jackson, he said he's alive, and Lucas said it's okay, he's still alive! Only that Pablo Hidalgo meanie says he's dead. Well, okay, but... Let's rewind. Whose opinion actually matters at this point? Uh, let, let's start with Samuel L. Jackson, though. Samuel L. Jackson, what is his position within all of this? He is, in essence, a fan at this point. He was someone who was involved by playing the character. He did not create the character. He did not write the character. He did not create Star Wars. He did not create the story of Revenge of the Sith. He came in and played a role. The role is done. He is gone. He is essentially a fan, a high-profile fan, but a fan making his assertion no better than head canon, personal canon, or fan fiction. His opinion on the subject doesn't matter. There is no official authority in the hands of the actors as to what's real or not within any Star Wars continuity, whether it's canon, legends, or whatever. So Samuel L. Jackson's assertion means Jack. He is gone. I am tired of these motherfucking misconceptions about this motherfucking fan theory from Samuel L. Jackson. Fine. But what about Lucas? Again, if this was a few years ago, it could make a huge, huge difference. Because we're operating under the Legends continuity as the official continuation of Star Wars. And in Legends, you had tiers of canon. G-level, T-level, C-level, S-level, N-level. N being non, S being secondary, the questionable stuff. C being continuity canon, which was the stuff like the books, the comics, the video games, and so forth. T-level canon, which was the Clone Wars. And G-level canon, which was... Lucas's original six films. And again, the idea being that G and T are special because it has Lucas's involvement and they can trump everything else. So if Lucas had come in and said, Mace Windu is alive, and you must integrate that, then that was the ball game. And the writers of the comics, the novels, and so forth would have to take that into account and do some retcons to make it work, probably through someone like Leland Chi. But let's clarify something here. George Lucas did not control the EU. George Lucas did not control the Legends continuity. He basically, at the beginning, said, Oh, you guys want to do a continuation that's official? That sounds pretty sweet. Lucasfilm, have at it. Enjoy yourselves. But understand that I can trump it anytime I want if I eventually decide to make new films. So they're doing all kinds of stuff, but whatever Lucas says or does can trump it. Uh, in general, he didn't really pay attention to it. He calls it the alternate universe that he doesn't really dabble in much. There are times when they asked his approval of certain things, like uh, how to portray the Sith in Tales of the Jedi, in which case he told them to treat it as a people, which the EU interpreted as a species rather than like a culture. Um, things like, hey, can we kill off Chewbacca? Okay, 
fine, you can kill off Chewbacca in Vector Prime and so forth. But in general, he took a very hands-off approach and didn't really care all that much about what was going on. And usually, when he did something like in, say, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, whatever, that had echoes within the continuity because they had to change things for it. Whether we're talking about the dates of the Clone Wars changing, the ages of characters changing, um, the nature of Jedi and relationships, or do Jedi just become Force ghosts automatically when they die, all that kind of stuff getting altered as we move through the continuity over the years because of new things Lucas is introducing. Uh, even something as asinine as him saying, well, the Sith homeworld is Moraband, not Korriband, boom, has an effect within the Legends continuity, and now it's they have to say, you know, well, if we're going to retcon this, we'll just say that it was known by alternate names and Korriband was one, but its main name is Moraband, whatever. What he said had echoes, but there were times they were allowed to supersede that and go their own way. Lucas is fond of saying that Boba Fett died at the Sarlacc pit, but he gave the nod to allow the official continuity Lucas film for their alternate universe in his eyes to allow Boba Fett to live and continue on having stories throughout the continuity. Doesn't mean that Lucas's view that Boba Fett is dead isn't true. It is as far as he is concerned in looking at his sort of version of the saga, but the alternate version, as he calls it, the EU, eh, whatever. It's not his defining version of the saga in his mind, and they can kind of do whatever they want. Yeah, might as well let them live. So for the sake of that, he was alive. But Lucas would get to make those types of calls if he wanted to, though usually he took a very hands-off approach. But this isn't a few years ago. Lucas, as Jackson himself said, no longer has anything to do with it. Lucas sold off Star Wars. He sold Lucasfilm with it the rights to Star Wars. All creative control over the saga has been passed along. He has no real connection to it from an authoritative sense anymore. He is the creator of Star Wars, the originator of Star Wars, but he has handed off his baby to someone else. Very much like, you know, you may be the biological parents, but if you sign those adoption papers and give up your parental rights, the legal parents, the legal guardians of that child, and the ones who will be raising them and actually have a say in the big decisions for them, is the adoptive parents, not you as the biological parents. You gave up those rights. Lucas gave up the rights to his baby, Star Wars, handing it off to Disney. Disney, at this point, has taken a firm hand, you could say, in guiding the saga from a higher planning level, but has delegated authority on deciding what is and isn't true and guiding the development of this new story group canon, or Disney canon, whatever you want to call it, canon, that they are creating with the new books and comics and so forth, to a group called the Lucasfilm Story Group. Among them, people like Leland Chi and Pablo Hidalgo. Essentially, they are a collective version of what Lucas used to be, the supreme authority when it comes to all things Star Wars. So when Pablo Hidalgo comes out and says, no, Mace died in Episode 3, condolences, we have to say, well, wait a second, who should we believe? You know, we don't believe Jackson, he's essentially just a fan, okay, so whatever. But what about Lucas and what about Pablo Hidalgo? Who do we believe? It was a few years ago, Lucas. Not anymore. Lucas, at this point, is very much like Mace Windu. Had an active involvement in the past, in his case, a huge involvement, and being the original creator. But now, as far as authority over what is or is not Star Wars, what counts or does not count, now that he has sold off the rights, he is basically a fan at this point, offering fan opinions, because none of what he says actually matters anymore. He stepped away and gave it up, and now he's kind of stuck with that, as are we. What about Pablo? Pablo isn't George Lucas. He didn't create Star Wars, so why can we trust him? Because he's a member of the story group, speaking on behalf of the story group, and the story group is who gets to make those decisions now that Disney owns Star Wars and Lucasfilm and has delegated that authority to the story group. So, yes, Pablo Hidalgo says Mace is dead. The end. That's it. Doesn't matter what Lucas says. Doesn't matter what Jackson says. They are essentially fans at this point with no actual authority over the saga anymore at all, if they ever had it. You know, causing Jackson in there. Pablo Hidalgo and the story group get to make that call. Now, does it mean that they could change their mind later? Absolutely, they could change their minds later. But as of now, the definitive answer is he's dead. Just like Lucas's definitive answer years ago when he had that authority was Maul's dead, and then he decided to bring Maul back in Clone Wars, and now he continues on into, for instance, Rebels, being guided, ironically, by the story group. 
the story group can say now, Mace is dead, and decide later, sure, I think I'm going to wind up, you know, bringing him back or something like that, so let's do it. But as of now, the official word is he's dead. And this is all tied up in this issue of intellectual honesty, because you have people out there saying, well, George Lucas created Star Wars, so what he says counts, even though he sold it. Bullshit. No, no, it doesn't. Intellectually dishonest, if you know how it actually works as far as who owns the rights, who gets to make the decisions, who's guiding the saga at this point officially, and so on. Um, and as that discussion boiled over, right, so we've got this intellectual honesty issue of having to recognize who actually has the authority over the saga at this point, and that it has changed since the sale, and putting into context what authority level, if any, Jackson, Lucas, or Hidalgo would have at this point in the context around which this decision of is Mace alive or not is being made, you have a lot of things boiling up in that angst over the whole Legends being superseded by canon thing that is now multi-years running. And you start to see argumentation that finally I get to a point where I just say, you know, I'm not even going to respond anymore. Um, two pop up that stand out to me that are basically on the same point. Um... There's a guy who posts regularly on the Facebook page for my Star Wars Timeline Gold. He is a fervent Legends guy and tends to go right to the edge of intellectual honesty or dishonesty a lot of the time in what he posts. Usually he'll go right at the edge of intellectual dishonesty. We'll have a, a long-running back and forth, and finally he'll be like, well, yeah, I recognize what the truth is, but I just don't like it. Well, fine, you can dislike the truth all you want, as long as you acknowledge what the truth actually is, and you're out there spouting bullshit all the time. Uh, that's not intellectually dishonest, unless you're spouting the bullshit. If you're just saying, yeah, yeah, I don't like it, that's being intellectually honest. You're acknowledging the truth, and you're acknowledging your actual feelings about it, your opinion based on what you see. Great! Um, but he makes a comment at one point in the discussion as sort of a, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw a bomb kind of moment, which was, a uh, well, guess what? None of the new stuff for the story group even matter anyway because they're all fan fiction because Lucas isn't involved. And then we had another person, similar discussion, going on on the Star Wars Beyond the Films Facebook page. And this person responds in a way that is intellectually dishonest, and I'm about to respond to the person, but then I realize what the name of the person or the group he's posting under onto the page is. And I forget the whole name. I'm not going to call him out by the whole name, but it starts with basically uh, Disney films are fan fiction, blah, blah, blah. So we have two different, they're fan fiction because Lucas isn't involved, claims being made. Again, unless these people don't understand the definition of fan fiction or don't understand who it is that gets to make these decisions and how those rights are transferred as far as intellectual property when it comes to the sale of companies and, and copyrights and that sort of thing, um, these people are being intellectually dishonest, unless they truly just do not understand it. Fan fiction. Fan fiction is something created by fans for a fictional universe, uh, for something they are fans of, like Star Wars, Star Trek, Farscape, whatever. But part of the defining fact of making them fan fiction is that they are unofficial. They have no official backing. They are not part of any kind of official continuity of any kind. They are fan-made creations, and essentially they are copyright violating, usually, and they are existing at the sufferance of the copyright holder, who could theoretically quash them at any time, but oftentimes allows that to flourish as a way of keeping fan interest in the saga alive. Unless you're Star Trek, in which case you want to make a whole bunch of rules that completely screw over anybody who's making decent Star Trek fan films at this point. But that is a whole other thing that maybe should get a, another vlog at some point. Um, but... Yeah. Fan fiction? No. This is stuff that's being put out by the current owners of Star Wars. As guided by the story group they've delegated the authority to, these are official Star Wars films. These are official Star Wars books, novels, whatever. Uh, I would say books and novels. Books, comics, etc. Um, this is a new canon that is official. As far as the owners of the saga are concerned... This is the new primary continuity of Star Wars. Like it or not, they get to make that decision. They've made it. That's the way it is. Calling it fan fiction, 
really just diminishes the credibility of the person speaking. If you don't like what they're doing with canon, if you want Legends back, and a lot of us would love to see Legends returning to have multiple product lines, it doesn't make business sense right now necessarily to do it because of the price involved in creating books and the publishing of hardbacks and all that kind of, you know, we can get into that at some point. But at some point, I'd love to see Legends actually return when it's more financially viable, even if it's digital only. Bring it back. Give us those two continuities. Star Wars fans aren't stupid. We're, well, some people are giving evidence that they might be by calling it fan fiction. But Star Wars fans in general aren't stupid. We can understand two different continuities. There are plenty of sagas in sci-fi that we follow as fans that have multiple continuities, and we get it. We're not dumb. Brand confusion won't be nearly as much of an issue as they might be afraid that it's going to be. But, for now, it is what it is. It is not fan fiction. It is the opposite of fan fiction. It is official works from a continuity deemed the official one at this time by the people who own the rights and actually get to make those decisions. Ironically, it was, it's just fan fiction that was a bomb that was constantly hurled at Legends, or the expanded universe, the official continuity, whatever you want to call it, back prior to the change, because Lucas didn't have that direct involvement with most of it, and he just let Lucasfilm kind of do their own thing, except every once in a while checking in with him on certain major aspects. Um, if anything, that's closer to fan fiction than what Disney's doing with canon, but that is still, for those who use that against the EU, not fan fiction. At the time, it was the official continuity as deemed official by Lucasfilm. It was not of a level on par with the films. It was C canon, not G, or even T, but it was the official continuity. It was being produced legally as a licensed work backed by with the support of the owners. So, yeah. Also not fan fiction when we're talking about the EU. But you would think especially that those who want to see Legends continue would be especially sensitive to the term fan fiction. And maybe they're throwing it around as a way of saying, ha you called us this, we can call you this. But isn't that like somebody coming out uh, and dropping a racial slur at you so it's okay to throw a racial slur back even though neither of them is appropriate? Really? The oppressed becoming the oppressor? Really? To what extent does that make any logical, intellectually honest sense? It doesn't. So either they're throwing around the word, not realizing it's false, which is highly, highly unlikely, because fan fiction is a pretty obvious term to define, or these people are being intentionally, intellectually dishonest, in which case you're undermining your own credibility. Think about this whole idea of credibility. You need to be able to gain support by speaking the truth, by arguing with facts, but it helps that people see a track record of those facts. I would like to think that between this vlog, my year since 97 working on the Star Wars Timeline Gold, the, th the few times I've been able to actually sort of dip in and help with certain things in the Legends continuity in minor, minor, minor ways, that I have developed a sense of credibility for those who watch this vlog or listen to the podcast or whatever. And I try very hard to stay away from intellectual dishonesty or error so that that credibility can be maintained. But let's think about credibility here. Let's take it completely out of Star Wars. Let's take someone like Attorney General Loretta Lynch, current Attorney General Loretta Lynch. We are just a few days removed here from the shootings of police officers in Dallas, Texas. Seven injured, five killed. And instead of coming out and speaking directly on this at first, President Obama left it to his Attorney General to be the one to come out and speak. And this is Attorney General Loretta Lynch. And she talked about bringing people together and so on. The problem was that a lot of people didn't take her seriously or scoffed as soon as she showed up at the podium at that press conference. Because within the week prior to that was the whole thing with FBI Director Comey coming out and giving all the layout of, here's all these things that prove gross negligence and such on the part of Hillary Clinton. But because she's a major candidate, and yes, that was in the speech, because she's a major candidate for office, it'd be too disruptive to charge her. We're not going to charge her. And Loretta Lynch, leading the Justice Department, says, yeah, we're going to go with that recommendation. We're not going to charge. After having had a clandestine meeting that the media was left out of about a week before, directly with Bill Clinton on a plane, touchdown on a tarmac, that still, to this day, details have not been released about. Now, whether there was anything screwy or corrupt going on there is a matter of 
drawing judgments based on what happened, if you're going to be intellectually honest about it. I don't want to get into that per se. But the perception, whether there was anything crooked or not, the perception was the fix was in, Hillary got off because she is a major presidential candidate, anybody else would have been completely screwed. Or as the, the, the meme going around says, you know, silly Americans, laws are for poor people, and so forth. Um, so when Lynch signed off on that, after having that meeting with Clinton, her credibility went down the toilet. And then she's the one that goes out speaking on the issue in Dallas, and she's not given the level of credibility she probably should talking on that issue because of what happened on the previous issue. Credibility matters, and intellectual honesty is part of building that credibility. If you are someone who wants Legends back and you're trying to make a credible argument for why it should return, then you need to make sure you're actually sticking to facts and being intellectually honest in the process of it, because instead you're going to undermine yourself by saying things that are demonstrably, obviously, objectively false, like saying, well, Disney's all fan fiction. No. No, it's not. You're either an idiot or you're a liar, and neither of which is productive to conversation. Get your shit straight, please. This actually brings me around to the next piece. We call it the third piece of this whole out there that I want to talk about as part of the four pieces here for this vlog, and that is an article recently released on FuriousFanboys.com. This is actually a site that I hadn't visited before. I'd heard of it, but a friend of mine pointed out this article when they were just going through and sharing various links and whatnot on Facebook, only to find that there's something in there that references me that I had seen before and didn't realize was referenced here. That'll be our next jumping off point. But this is an article, a blog, entitled Bring Back Legends Wants to Be Taken Seriously? Here's How, by Jeremy Conrad. And he basically says, if I can run through this here, if you're looking for the actual one, here's the link beneath furiousfanboys.com slash 2016 slash 07. Bring back legends once taken seriously. Here's with no apostrophe and with dashes in between the various words there. He says, the Alliance to Restore the Expanded Universe. Bring back legends. Give us legends. New Republic Historical Office. No matter what you want to call them, there is a movement of a small group of Star Wars fans committed to the original Expanded Universe, and they want it back. The problem is with how they're trying to get their way. Recently, I was alerted to this post by a Legends Facebook group where they were complaining that they don't have the same access to Lucasfilm as other Star Wars fan sites. That link is what we're going to come back to. Well, there's a reason for that, and it's for what some members of the movement have been doing. Some people see these groups as full-on harassment groups who result, I think he means resort, to immature methods to try to get their way. If they want to be taken seriously, then they seriously need to police their members and ensure the following things do not happen. Do not disrupt panels at a convention where you don't agree with canon stuff being discussed. Do not accost people at conventions and shove flyers in their face. Do not accuse a fan dying of cancer of being a marketing stunt by J.J. Abrams. Do not spam Star Wars spoilers to other fans in an attempt to get Lucasfilm to give in to your demands. Do not organize negative Amazon review campaigns to attempt to torpedo a book that isn't set in the non-canon Legends universe. Do not make YouTube videos threatening violence against people who like all Star Wars canon. Do not harass bloggers who point out the bad things the movement does. Do not brigade Facebook pages with spam reports in an attempt to censor them from reporting on what the movement is doing. As long as people connected to the Bring Back Legends movement and their similar groups are participating in any of the actions above, they'll never be taken seriously by Disney or Lucasfilm. They can plaster billboards all over San Francisco, where Lucasfilm is, or even Burbank, where Disney is, and no one will take them seriously or give them access if harassment and threats are being carried out in their name. The Alliance to Restore the Expanded Universe Facebook group, which is closed so no one can see their organizing posts, did recently expel one user who was posting YouTube videos threatening to kill anyone who liked Disney Star Wars. As an aside... More of that needs to happen. Those who are leading these groups need to ban anyone found to be participating in harassment and seriously work to restore their image. Until that happens, most Star Wars fan sites will continue to have a zero-tolerance stance on these groups' attempts to harass people into submission. Again, that is from Furious Fanboys writer Jeremy Conrad on July 5th of this year. And in a sense, what that's coming down to, I think that is some pretty good advice. It basically boils down to don't be a dick and make your arguments in an intellectually honest way. Make your arguments in a cogent, cordial way. You're not going to convince a business to change its business practice to do what you want by being a douchebag, by threatening people, by harassing people, by attacking their customers, 
by attacking their authors and so forth. Uh, at least if that is in the vein of what has been done here, where it's not an attack in the terms of attacking through argumentation, but just personal threats, flame war kind of stuff. It's not going to work. We're not in an era when, in this case, the squeaky wheel is going to get the grease. If the squeaky wheel is going to have people just take that cart with a squeaky wheel, throw it the fuck away, and grab a new cart. Um, that's not going to work at this point. It doesn't matter how vehement the movement is. It matters how intellectually solid their arguments are. Use some business arguments, and maybe you'll be able to get them to say, you know what, maybe financially this could work. Use business or creativity arguments. Basically, argue the merits of your case. Argue the merits of replacing what they're doing now with a better policy in your eyes of what you would like them to do. Show them that it's viable. Show them that financially it would be profitable to them. And maybe you'll be able to have an impact. It may be a long-run impact where they see this interest still continuing year after year after year and finally decide to bring back legends in some sense other than just the old republic. But that's going to make a positive impact. They're going to sit back and say, you know what, here's a part of our fan base that maybe we're not addressing. They're awesome, so let's try to address it. But they're not going to think, they're awesome, let's address it, if they're also thinking, wow, these are some real assholes. Screw that. They're going to put on blinders to your argument. They're going to ignore what you're doing, just like you would ignore someone sitting back at a political rally who's just yelling out racial epithets if you actually want to hear substantive discussion. Watch the debate. Ignore the dipshit in the back. Don't be the dipshit in the back. Make coherent, intellectually honest arguments. Don't call it fan fiction when it's not. Don't argue that Lucas is still in charge when he's not. Don't argue that Expanded Universe readers were the majority of Star Wars customers. We never were. But make arguments on the sales numbers. Make arguments on the profitability, the number of people out there wanting to buy it, uh, the avenues for further exploration of stories, how to avoid brand confusion. Convince them through your argumentation. Threatening them is not going to work. Threatening Salvatore never did bring back Chewbacca did it. I would like to think that Star Wars fandom, in general, is a very positive fandom. Star Wars fandom does a lot of things for charity, tons and tons of charity work to help people, uh, out of the goodness of their hearts, spending time and money to do things like creating costumes for fun that they then go and do for charity, not trying to take any money for themselves. Um, Star Wars fans go out and do all kinds of outreach programs. We have lots and lots of podcasts out there for good, substantive discussion. Uh, we have good relationships in many cases with the creators who actually look at fan opinion as opposed to other franchises where they try to shut fans down, Star Trek fan films. There is a large positive nature of Star Wars. And I think part of it comes from growing up with the message of Star Wars, the light side versus the dark side, trying to do right, standing up against corruption and evil, and so forth. I think we are a fandom that is very positive most of the time. But as is always the case, there are those on the extremes. And those on the extremes oftentimes get a lot of attention because they're being the loudest and a lot of times the most abrasive. Those voices can't be the only ones that Disney and Lucasfilm are hearing or the main ones or the loudest ones that they're hearing or we're not going to see Legends get continued. We're just not. So we have to find a way to make sure that those voices aren't the voices of any kind of continue legends movement, whether it's what I believe, which would be the idea of there should continue legends at some point alongside canon, so we have essentially two continuities because we're not stupid and we can tell them apart. Um, although, again, there's a business consideration to be taken into case there, but eventually you could make the business argument for it. Um, or someone who says, get rid of canon entirely, let's go back to legends. Or let's come up with some kind of hybrid thing where we can make it all kind of mixed together so the new films can exist, but not necessarily run roughshod over what came before, though I don't know how they managed to do that in terms of retcons and whatnot. But it can't be the extremes. The extremes aren't going to get it done. And I know that is what our society is at this point. Uh, I really am feeling like we're kind of living in 1968 this year, after what happened the last few days. Uh, we are at the extremes. We have two extremes running for office. A woman who could not have beaten almost any other Republican. A man who could beat almost no Democrats. And they're the ones running against each other. 
extremes on both sides, extreme corruption on both sides, lying on both sides, and yet these are who they're like, yeah, go out and do it. Hillary, girl power. Trump, orange people power, or whatever. Um, and the fact that social media basically makes it as, as sort of the great equalizer, right? I may not know what the fuck I'm talking about, but I'm sure going to talk about it a lot. And if I do it the right way, it will become clickbait, and I will become famous. Lots of likes. Whatever. At some point, you have to value logic, honesty, intellectual honesty, coherent argument, and being in touch with reality! Because there's so much around us that isn't. Now... That being said, he talked about this post. I want to get into something a little more specific to me and my sites and my Facebook page or pages at this point. Um, that post he referenced about one of these fan groups saying, well, we don't have access or whatever, because in that post, I am directly attacked. Now, I had seen this before. Someone had pointed it out to me through a screenshot of this closed group's post. Um, I saw it, commented on it on the, on the Facebook page, didn't really know whether or not to ever bring it up on the vlog or anything like that, only to find that that Furious Fanboys article has a link to it, and apparently this is an image capture that has gotten around, which means that a significant number, relatively speaking, have seen it. Significant being, you know, more than two or three, probably less than a few hundred at best. Um, but I want to address some of the things here because it plays directly into why and how I moderate the pages that I run on Facebook the way that I do. So this is a post from New Republic Historical Office, a group I had never heard of before, but apparently is one of the big um, Give Us Legends type groups. Access. It's why the EU and the EU movement get so little attention and respect from the big Star Wars fan sites and from the entertainment media. Before the buyout, for many years, Lucasfilm went out of its way to make contact and connections with the various major fan sites. It was meant to be the way of keeping up good relations with the fan base. The big sites all had regular contact with Lucasfilm and usually got advanced news of big announcements and other perks from being big-name fans. Many of the more outspoken fans on the internet even got to write some Star Wars books or comics. Nathan Butler and Curtis Saxon come to mind. Rewinding here. Um, advanced notice of things? I never got advanced notice of things, not that I recall. The closest to that is that if you are a fan site that does reviews and a reputable fan site, you can basically apply through Del Rey and, and uh, Disney Lucasfilm Press now to be sent review copies, uh, advanced review copies of books. But I think the only time I was ever told you know, I was ever told something was coming in advance was when Leland Chi sent me an email and said, "Hey, uh, these are the dates we're going to be using for the uh, the Old Republic timeline videos. Can you do a quick run through? Do you?" see any errors in this. The first time I was ever asked to proofread something that kind of blew my mind. Um, but beyond that, I can't recall a lot of being given that advanced news. Though this could be referring to things like, say, the Force.net, uh, Jedi News, or, or whatever over the years, because certainly there are much, much, much bigger fan sites than anything that I'm involved with. But he quotes there, and yes, I did get a chance to write uh, for tales and got a chance to help on the atlas and why a big part of it was the intellectual honesty aspect when i was given the opportunity to write for tales which is that first opportunity uh basically i was told that the reasons were that my timeline showed that i understood continuity well my audio drama second strike at the time showed that i could tell a story and my basically my rant actually a, an intellectually honest rant against Dark Horse and their constant delays and bad proofreading comics at the time had shown that I had a passion for the saga and taking it seriously on an intellectual level. So, hey, here's an opportunity to write because they happen to have the ability to bring in somebody who wasn't established at that point to write for Star Wars Tales. Um, so in a sense, what I've been arguing at this point, the intellectual honesty thing, was part of what got me in the door. And I even said at the beginning, and I've still got the original email somewhere sitting in a binder up in the closet, my... Uh, my big binder of everything from writing for Tales, where one of the first things I asked Jeremy Barlow when he asked, would I like to write for Tales, I asked, would this have any impact on me being able to do the timeline or the podcasts and, and being sort of the loyal opposition, you know, pointing out flaws and trying to make things better? And he said, no, it would not. But that was one of my major concerns, intellectual honesty, even back then. So, yes, got a chance to write, kind of plays into the bigger theme here. 
Not sure about the access to early news, but whatever. So when your site gets inside news and input from Lucasfilm, or when you're a big-name fan whose fan project has led to actual writing jobs, or when you're an entertainment news hype site that relies on being in good graces with the major entertainment companies, you aren't in a rush to disagree with them or denounce them. <laughs> Rewind. I don't know how the other sites play it. Um, you can check my reviews of things on StarWarsReport.com. I don't provide or listen to Star Wars Beyond the Films. I don't provide glowing reviews for everything that is being produced by Lucasfilm or Marvel or whoever at this point. There are some pretty negative reviews that I've written up on uh, StarWarsReport.com for some of the things I've been sent review copies of by either Disney, Lucasfilm Press, or Del Rey. And I, unless you haven't been listening to Star Wars Beyond the Films, you know, uh, you should know that. I tore the shit out of, for instance, the uh, Princess Leia comic series because it was garbage and didn't do anything to advance Leia's character. If anything, it turned her into its typical teenager. You know, if anything, things would stop going wrong for two seconds and all that crap. Um, I take great offense to the idea that being someone who had a chance to write for Star Wars at some point, he just wouldn't disagree. I disagree all the time. Listen to the podcasts, check out the posts on the Facebook pages, uh, check out these videos and so forth. Um, check out the reviews on StarWarsReport.com. To, to say that in my case shows that this individual didn't do a damn bit of research before making this claim. But they then continue on specifically with me. It's how we have Nathan Butler on the Star Wars Timeline Gold page banning people who disagree with his assertion that fans don't have the right to choose Legends over the reboot because he argues that as copyright holder, Disney can mandate what Star Wars is, and fans have no choice but to obey and forget Legends in favor of the reboot. His term for fans who have refused to abandon the EU is intellectually dishonest. Talk about some misinterpretation and kind of twisting of facts here. Um, I have never said that fans can't choose what to like, Legends or canon. I personally enjoy both. Legends is actually most of this back here. They're able to portray me as a Legends hater at, at some points, which is kind of funny, because, dang, yeah, I must hate Legends. I always take up about six foot of shelf space in my office with a whole bunch of books from a continuity I can't stand. It's just my way of torturing myself all the time. But there's a difference between saying fans can choose what they like and prefer than saying fans can choose what counts or not. Fans can choose what is officially Star Wars now or not. Because no, fans can't make that decision because, yes, someone owns it. It is not in the public domain. Someone owns it, in this case, Disney. And yes, they are the ones making decisions on what counts or doesn't, what is canon or not, what continuity takes precedence or doesn't. Yes, they do. Yes, they do get to decide that. And yes, if you deny that, you are being intellectually dishonest. Exactly. That's exactly my word for it. But not for people who say... Well, I just prefer this over that. No. That is a matter of, again, intellectual honesty in opinion. If someone sees canon and legends and prefers legends for various reasons that they argue the merits of, then, yeah, go for it. That's a valid opinion to have. But it's not opinion to say that, well, legends is Star Wars and Disney's story group canon is not. That's not intellectually honest. Interesting way of interpreting what the case was. Because, see, here's the way that it works on the page, the Facebook page for the Star Wars Timeline Gold, the one that I don't share any kind of of moderating. On on Beyond the Films, I moderate with Mark. Uh, on the page for Classic Casino, I moderate with Michael. On the Timeline Gold's page, it's just me. It's just my project. What I put forth as policy for that page is very simple. Okay? I want to see productive, lively, interesting, intellectually honest discussion. So, discuss away. Have at it. You love Legends and you're against canon? Express it. You love canon and you're against Legends? Express it. You have vehement opinions? Express them. But, it needs to be based on fact. It needs to be based on being intellectually honest. Don't be feeding us a line of bullshit and make that your case to make the argument because you're going to confuse people who aren't as in the know, who aren't as well-versed in what's going on, it happens a lot that people get confused because they just hear the voices yelling the loudest and assume that must be true. Um, 
So if you are someone who shows up and starts spouting incorrect stuff, like that guy I mentioned before, who mentioned the fan fiction thing, then we're going to correct you. The community is around it, or I'm going to say, actually, that's not how it works. Here's what it is. I'll be very cordial about it. I'll lay out the facts of the case. But after a while, if you're still spouting bullshit, and now you definitely know better, and you've got the proof sitting right in front of you, then yes, if you're someone there actively, purposely pushing false information, I will ban you. Why? Because the decision is made to keep it an intellectually honest place, and that's all that I ask for discussion. Be intellectually honest, don't attack each other, and try to abstain from rampant profanity, which, you know, depends on the medium here, whatever, don't care. So I'm kind of like, eh? You know, I had to decide at some point, was I going to do any banning? But we had people who were attacking and pulling intellectually dishonest bullshit at the same time. Those people were gone. We had people pulling just intellectually dishonest stuff over the span of weeks and had people getting confused by it. Finally just had to put my foot down and say, no, we got to keep things intellectually honest. I'll give you as much benefit of the doubt to say that you're mistaken or wrong or just need something clarified as possible. But at the end of the day, if you're still spouting the bullshit, you're gone. And you might sit back and you hear people say, that's against freedom of speech. It's violating their freedom of speech. No, actually. Here's the thing. Freedom of speech, First Amendment stuff, that does have to do with government censorship. It has nothing to do with private companies, privately run pages, privately run uh, websites, forums, and things like that. It's about the government not being able to abridge your freedom of speech. Uh, a company can make whatever rules they want as far as the speech for their, uh, their, their employees. For instance, I can't say, welcome to McDonald's, the fuck you want. I'm gone. Can't be saying stuff like that. Right? I can't, as Tinker v. Des Moines, or I guess it was Hazel would be Comey or Tinker v. Des Moines talked about uh, when it comes to censorship uh, and the idea that, hey, clothing can be, what you're wearing can be a form of expression. Um, a business can have a dress code. That is not a violation of the First Amendment. When, when the Duck Dynasty guy comes out and expresses opinions that A&E, I think it was, disagreed with on an issue and that they thought might cast their company in a bad light in terms of what they think their audience wants to see, they were well within their rights to suspend or boot or whatever the guy because they get to decide what essentially the code of conduct is for their company. Freedom of speech is a government intrusion issue. Uh, when it comes to forums, companies, Facebook can have you have terms of service and ban you for certain things on Facebook. And yes, people who run forums and people who run Facebook pages can set guidelines for the discussion on those forums or pages and make you adhere to them as part of requiring, hey, if you're going to be here, these are the rules you got to follow. Very simple. There is no violation of freedom of speech there. If you think that's what freedom of speech is, go back to school. Because that's not what it is. At least not in the United States. That said, I'll note that I've had to ban, I think it's less than five people. I know it's less than ten in the entire lifetime of the Star Wars Timeline Gold's Facebook page and the Timeline Gold previously having a space on a message board for discussion. So in the span of at least a decade, probably more, less than 10, probably less than 5, all either spouting intellectually dishonest bullshit, constantly knowing better, or attacking others, or in most cases, both. But of course, this has nothing to do with the fact that they were attacking others or being intellectually dishonest or violating the terms of service, essentially, the terms of being part of that community on that board. Of course, this is because I have my head so far up Disney's ass that I look like Sean Hannity with his head up Trump's ass, and I can't see daylight. I'm just going to do whatever my puppet masters want me to do. I am a corporate stooge because every so often I get a book for review, and because over a decade ago I got a chance to write for Star Wars Tales, under a company that has no relevance in the grand scheme of things for Star Wars anymore, Dark Horse Comics. Yes, yes, I am just a puppet. See my strings. Or wait, does that make me evil then if I quote Ultron, who is quoting Pinocchio, and say, There are no strings on me. They continue. They took an approximately 20-year project he had been working on, talking about my Star Wars timeline gold, which has been around since 97, and told him it was worthless. And he agreed, and now tries to tell others the same thing. It's hard to imagine someone doing that without some level of pressure or manipulation. Boop, boop, boop. Time out again. Completely full of shit. Okay. 
Well, okay, they got right the fact that I've been doing it for almost 20 years. That's the point at which they've actually got something correct here. Um, did they tell me it was worthless? I guess they're, they're talking like a grand scheme of things by making the decision it was an implied telling that it was worthless. Um, no. If they actually bothered to look at what they were talking about, the timeline gold itself, um, no. The project has continued. The project has been essentially just updated so that now the old, you know, Volume 1 and Volume 2 are Legends Volume 1 and Volume 2. The Clone Wars supplement is Legends Clone Wars supplement, and that was just a new document for canon. And I'm chronicling that while still chronicling old things I had never gotten to for Legends, the more obscure stuff along the way. If anything, it's brought more interest in the Star Wars timeline goal because people want to know how canon fits together in a similar way to what I did with all the legend stuff, with all the summaries and individual events and so forth. And what they came in and said was, these documents of yours aren't covering what is now the key continuity anymore. Okay, I started another document. The timeline is still flourishing. At no point was it a, oh man, I'm screwed. There was a point where I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep working on it because I didn't know if I would have the time to really do it and that maybe I just wanted to end it there with Legends, but that was a brief thing. and I was, I was closer to that with the whole bullshit in 2008 with Clone Wars coming in and wrecking the previous Clone Wars continuity than I was with the whole Legends canon thing. But again, truth doesn't matter to these people. It's not about intellectual honesty. It's about trying to make their case, in this case, by manipulating facts or trying to come up with facts to manipulate that aren't true. Uh, it's hard to imagine someone doing that with some, without some kind of pressure or manipulation. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. I was pressured or manipulated into continuing to work on this labor of love I've worked on for years. I was pressured into not walking away from it and just continuing to work on it, just adding a new document to the whole thing. Maybe pressured by circumstances if I wanted to be intellectually honest and be providing information that was accurate to people. Yes, I needed to have another document, and I needed to keep it going. But Disney knocking on the door, Lucasfilm knocking on the door, Pablo, whoever knocking on the door, and saying, look, you're going to continue it. You're going to do it. And you're going to accept the fact that Legends is gone. Or else. Yeah, not so much. And nothing figuratively like that either. Or financially like that. There is no manipulation Ugh, just, these guys are just so far off the mark and so completely full of shit that, again, like I said, I wasn't necessarily going to address it, but then here it shows up and apparently the image of this response or this uh, post has been around for a while. So, to continue, it's now we have fan sites like Club Jade and TheForce.net, which love the EU, and as soon as it was Lucasfilm's policy to denounce it, they obediently did the same and began to purge references and mentions of it from their sites and take a strongly anti-EU and anti-EU fan editorial tone. That I can't speak to. I don't visit Club Jade. I don't visit TheForce.net. I have no idea what their tone is, though I highly doubt it's because they're being manipulated by some kind of puppet masters back at Disney. I have no idea. Uh, but it certainly doesn't apply in my case. It's how we have fan sites, which are curiously silent about the EU billboard. Yet mainstream media covered the billboard, but always with a little caveat that what we're asking is against official Disney policy, as if that's going to stop us from asking. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome to ask. And? Is it bad that they're saying that it is against Disney's current policy? No. Are they saying it to shut you up, or are they saying it to make it clear to the audience that they're reporting to? Probably the latter. I doubt many of those mainstream media news sources give a shit about what's happening with which continuity is taking precedence in Star Wars at this point. They're reporting on the story that was created by creating the billboard. And certainly, I would not be included among the fan sites that didn't report on that, because I did mention it a couple of times on the pages. And I should point out, there's an entire vlog on that issue, Chuck Wendig's response to it, and more here on this channel. Simply put, Disney uses the implied or possibly explicit threat of revoking access that big-name fan sites, media organizations, and big-name fans have to ensure they support the reboot. It's the only way to explain how people who love the EU and supported it for years now make long editorials denouncing and breathlessly saying how bad it was and that it was always bad. Again, time out. Um, so Disney is threatening people's access? What access exactly is that? Uh, again, I don't know what they mean by access. Review copies? They don't care if we post a negative review as long as we're posting reviews. They're hoping 
that people will see it and get interested and buy it at some point. At least I've never had anyone from Del Rey, from Lucasfilm, from Disney, Lucasfilm Press, anybody like that say, how dare you post this negative review, or hey, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all or anything like that. I have yet to ever see that happen. I've never seen a fan site getting pressure from Lucasfilm being told, you must take this tone or else. If anything, they tend to be perhaps more amenable to those who are being amenable to them, but I'm not even sure that it's amenable to their view so much as just being respectful. Being reporting on things factually, they respect. Um, that I can't say. As far as my access goes, yeah, I had some because I was asking questions on the old uh, message board for StarWars.com. I had a chance to write for Dark Horse, which brought me into contact with some people. I uh, eventually had a chance to help on the Atlas, which brought me into contact with some people. Um, and prior to that, and during that process, and at various times, my timeline has been referenced by and used as a reference work for those working on official guides, like the new Essential Guide to Characters or the Essential Reader Companion. Um, essentially an earned access. But even then, the access to Leland Chi that used to be easy through email, that barely exists anymore, if at all, because there are very specific rules now that Disney has about interactions with fans. Um, and in that case... His interaction, unless it's, it's like if it's a timeline or continuity related thing, unless it's something that's part of like a press release or something they're officially out there saying, he's not able to answer those individual questions. Pablo Hidalgo is more upfront with that sort of thing now, and he's sort of been the person to ask, whether it's Twitter or elsewhere. Um, but I don't see this kind of manipulation of access that they're talking about, unless they're talking about sites way bigger than mine out there doing their own thing. But to put me into that category is intellectually dishonest, and I take it as somewhat insulting. Now, there's plenty of ways you could explain someone bashing the EU who used to love it. Maybe they were just pretending to love it because that was the way that fandom was going at the time. Maybe they were closet haters. Uh, maybe they've taken a new evaluation of it, comparing it to the new canon, and say that new canon is better, though... In my opinion, new canon, except for a couple of books that are really good so far, has yet to hit the heights of almost anything uh, of the better stuff that Legends have ever done. It's, it still feels very weak to me. It's a weak conglomeration waiting for something big to happen other than films. Um, so there's, there's no other way? Or in my case, you know, being able to be out there and say, hey, I can be intellectually honest, and I can be an open-minded fan, and I can actually like both. I shit you not. You can be a Star Wars fan and like both. And it's okay. You don't have to choose one or the other. I know, it blows your fucking mind, doesn't it? Just pff, get yourself a helmet because the pieces of your gray matter are going to be flying everywhere. You want to keep them safe. The only explanation is manipulation or threat? Are you kidding me? Perhaps the explanation is that we are sci-fi fans who are used to having different franchises we love have multiple continuities at different times, or maybe we were just Trek fans at some point, and now we're used to this thanks to what happened in 2009 with Trek, and we are able to enjoy Star Wars in general, whether it's the Legends continuity, or canon, or the old Infinities stuff, perhaps, or the Lego stuff, or the Disney stuff, whatever. We're able to step in and say, we love Star Wars, we're going to try to enjoy this thing and see how it is, and just judge it by its own merits. Um, it is perfectly fine to say, I love Legends, I'm not going to read any canon, or I love canon, I'm not going to read any Legends. That's fine. Personal preference. But to say that the only reason why someone could actually be okay with both is threat? Obviously that is wrong. That's not necessarily what they're implying here. They're implying that the change from EU love to something else is because of manipulation. Now... In that case, they're specifically mentioning, to be intellectually honest here, they're specifically mentioning hate. I'm hoping they don't let me in, because again, like I said, I don't usually spend six or whatever it is feet of shelf space in my room for stuff that I hate. Um, again, I love Legends. It's just not something that's really growing right now, so my focus tends to be on canon, because that's where it's growing, and that's what I can keep chronicling for the timeline goal at this point. And I'm assuming that they're not claiming that I'm a hater here, but maybe they're lumping me in, because they certainly use me as a case example and this whole spiel. But let me put it out there. Not a Legends hater. Love Legends. Enjoying canon as well. I can like both. That is not intellectually dishonest. That is not a crime against fandom. 
But it is not intellectually honest to say that the only reason why someone's opinion could change, even if it is a drastic change, is because of threat. If you believe that is the only case, you are an idiot. They continue. I have no access. I'm assuming this is the person that runs it because he's posting under the name of the site. I have no access. I'm not a big name fan. They have no hold over me. But I am a lifelong Star Wars fan who will keep fighting with the rebellion against Disney. We will keep asking for continuation of the expanded universe, not having EU characters inserted into their reboot. I reject the reboot and everything that's in it. I don't care about Rogue One. I don't care about their reboot movies and reboot novels. We want legends. And all of that is perfectly fine. That is all personal opinion. Says he has no access? Okay, fine. Not a big name fan? Okay, I'll take him at his word on that. Um, they have no hold over him? Okay, fine. Lifelong Star Wars fan? Keep fighting. Keep asking for a continuation. Uh, keep hoping that we'll see more EU material as opposed to EU characters showing up inserted into the, the reboot, the Disney canon and all that. Um, rejecting that and all that's in it, as long as it's not rejecting that that's official Star Wars now but rejecting it as a fan of, I'm not going to buy it, I'm not going to prefer that, I don't like it. Uh, not caring about Rogue One, not caring about the reboot movies and novels, wanting legends, all of that, perfectly intellectually honest, because it is opinion. And it's opinion based on a foundation of what they see in the facts and their own perceptions of the different continuities there. But much of this message is complete and utter bullshit or manipulation of fact. This is what I mean. Even when you're being long-winded and have all kinds of, of case examples you're trying to use, if you are not telling the truth, whether you are mistaken or being intentionally intellectually dishonest, you are damaging your credibility. Anybody who knows the slightest thing about me, the timeline, the podcast, anything of my involvement within fandom would be able to tell you he doesn't censor his opinions on this kind of stuff, and there was no pressure, and... He's still doing the timeline, and it's still out there doing as well, if not better, than it's ever been before. He's more involved than before. Um, where they get this kind of shit, I don't know. Unless, again, their head is up someone's ass, and they come out with it stuck in their nostrils or something. In which case, I, I'm not sure I really want to know about that. Figuratively speaking, of course. Now, there was a response to this that was posted that is also part of that image that has been making the rounds. I wanted to share what was said, the bullshit said about me, and set the record straight. But, to be fair, we should also probably get into what the other side of this argument was at the time, because that is the image that's out there. It is a side-by-side -side pair of messages, one from the New Republic Historical Office, as they call themselves, one from a group calling themselves the Star Wars Hub. Star Wars Hub said, quote, It's how we have fan sites which were curiously silent about the EU billboard. Actually, we here can answer that for you, since we're a collaboration of fan sites such as the Star Wars Underworld, Star Wars Headquarters, that's Star Wars HQ, the Star Wars Guru, and Star Wars Battlefront Updates. And between us, no Hello Greedo, Toshi Station, TheForce.net, Club Jade, and Yodasnews.com. You are known to these sites. They just don't want to give you any press. Because Give Us Legends and the Alliance to Preserve the EU have a bad reputation. To add, creating posts slash pages like this doesn't help. It's two-faced. Also, previous incidents don't help either. I'm talking about the two-faced thing, and I think they mention it here in a bit. Um, I should point out that while this group is criticizing me for banning the intellectually dishonest uh, continuing of pushing of false information, uh, the misleading of people, and the attacks and whatnot being made on the Star Wars Timeline Gold's Facebook page and mischaracterizing it, this is a group who is a closed group who is known for banning anyone who expresses a view different from the one that they espouse. Not because they're pushing intellectually dishonest information, not because they're spewing false information, but because they have a difference of opinion, which is not something I would ever ban someone for, but something they do on a regular basis in large numbers. Just putting that out there in terms of hypocrisy. To continue from the Star Wars hub, the spoiler raid. I won't call it a jihad, and that is downright silly. But the pages like the above were put at risk due to that stunt. So admin slash pages slash groups were warned. Turned out some already knew of the alliance to preserve the EU, and not in a positive way. It just happened to go viral. The incidents that happened at Dragon Con, which in turn lead to the harassment and threats to Tashi Station, similar to Furious Fanboys. Majority of the pages above know of that, so they won't cover you. 
Lucasfilm staff such as Pablo Hidalgo, Chuck Wendig, Leland Chi, and others. Some also know of what was said about Daniel Fleetwood in Alliance Group before and after his passing. Underworld's admins, along with the guru, found it sick and shocking at what was said, especially from Megan, whoever that is. Her words, a marketing gag, was disrespectful after so many fans came together to spread the word of his wish for hashtag force for Daniel. So you are more or less known to fan sites, just not in a good way, and they don't want to give the movement the time of day. If things were to change, like page titles, admins, methods, and organization, some would consider helping slash reporting you. But posting stuff like this doesn't help you, so they don't help you. One would call this a tinfoil hat conspiracy, and that's an actual quote from one of the above. Because of that, they don't take you seriously. Just some don't trust you due to the closed group of T-A-T-P-T-E-U, the alliance to, yeah. And some due to past events. Make amends. Don't be asking for legends on one page, yet talk behind their back about them on others. Because some know. Because if some know, others will know it too. So there you have it. Why the EU movement gets so little attention and respect from the big Star Wars fan sites. Take this in and learn from it. Again, on Reputation, this page has one on deleting slash banning. Yes, you might not like this, but take from it. Don't delete it. Work from it. Make amends. Build bridges. And they might. They might consider giving you some attention. Give this post some thought. Sleep on it. Whatever. Because if you know, you can then improve upon it. This is apparently the head admin for that group. And that gets back to what I was saying before. If we're going to see a continuation of Legends, we need to be doing this in a way that is intellectually honest, that is respectful, and that is making a cogent argument for why it should happen. From a business sense, from a creative sense, from any angle to come from, but not through threats, not through manipulation, not through tinfoil hat conspiracy theories about threats about losing access and bullshit like that. Stick to the facts. Get your facts in order, build them into a strong case, and make the case. But as the Furious Fanboys post that I quoted a moment ago got into, there are some bad behaviors going on out there that are the loudest of the flock, and those bad behaviors need to be quelled, either from inside, by those actors, or whatever, so that the Continue Legends message can be heard without the immediate knee-jerk reaction of, oh, it's those people, that's tied into the actions of the bad actors. But this particular post is a perfect example to me, in my context, of why it is that it's hard to give these groups really the time of day when it comes to taking them seriously. Like this particular group, I have no idea who the person is that made the actual post, I just know the name of the group. But now, having seen how they manipulate information and just spout flat out lies and conspiracy theories, I have no reason to ever take anything that group says again seriously. They now lack, in my eyes, credibility. Now they would need to build back up that credibility in order for there to be some positive dialogue going on. In essence, they just told Hillary Clinton, you get off scot-free because you're a candidate, and then came out and tried to address the nation, so to speak. So if there is one lesson to take from all of this, what is it? Whether it's Mace Windu, calling things fan fiction, posts like these, or going off the rails and needing to rein things back in order to get positive attention. That's right, it's that buzzword that I keep using, that pair of buzzwords, that buzz pair, that buzz compound word. Intellectual honesty. Let's have productive discussion. Let's try to actually get legends back in a positive way. I would love to see it. I know a lot of fans would love to see it. Even if Legends fans don't make up the majority, we're a sizable chunk of fandom and certainly we'd love to see it. But let's not attack each other in the process. Let's actually try to be honest. Let's actually try to build bridges. Let's actually try to discuss in productive ways. And then, well, you won't need a blog like this calling people out on their bullshit, nor would you need people being banned from various pages for spouting similar bullshit. Seriously, if we all act like adults, guess what? Things get done unless you're in Washington, D.C., but I can't remember the last time they acted like adults either. With that, we'll wrap up this rather long vlog. Thank you for watching, for those of you who have. I'm sure there'll be some vehement comments down in the comments. Whatever. Have fun with it. Just try to be intellectually honest about it. I think uh, 
the majority will probably be so, hopefully getting the message of this, but I'm sure there'll be some who are just like, how dare you quote our website, Jihad! Lucas Hu Akbar! Lucas Hu Akbar! And that sort of thing. Um, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, we'll get some productive discussion going on this important issue of intellectual honesty. Thank you for watching again, and may the force be with you.